Thank you, Rashmi. A very uh, good morning to all. Most uh, respected and uh, distinguished uh, resource person for uh, today's uh, special lecture, Sri V. Sudish Pai, Professor uh, Ishwar Bhatt, Honorable Vice Chancellor, esteemed uh, syndicate and uh, academic council members, Registrar of the University, Mr. Mohammad Zubair, Professor G.B. Patil, Registrar Evaluation, principals and teachers from affiliated and other law colleges, esteemed invitees, dear faculty members and dear students. Scholarly research and pursuit for knowledge is the heritage of Karnataka State Law University. As part of this scholastic design, Various academic activities have been formatted under the stewardship of Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor P. Ishwar Bhatt. The special lecture series are illustrations of such academic programs of the university. In fact, special lectures are crucial to strengthen and enhance the understanding of the subject by adding a wide range of perspectives. The topic for today's special lecture, the basic structure doctrine in Indian constitutional law, genesis, nuances, and perils. The basic structure doctrine is the fundamental judicial principles connected with the Indian constitution this doctrine holds uh, this doctrine holds that there is a basic structure to the indian constitution and the parliament of india cannot amend the basic features but the criticism against basic structure doctrine is that it is vague and uh, undefined concept it has given judiciary limitless power and has deflected the balance of power decisively in favor of judiciary at the cost of parliament. That is, the judiciary, the guardians of the constitution have become guardians over the constitution. To address on this topic of immense importance, we have scholar of high repute, Sri V. Sudish Pai, a distinguished lawyer and a jurist, and an acclaimed author specializing in constitutional law and administrative law. Sir's contribution to academics, particularly in the area of critical constitutional analysis, has been substantial and uh, very significant. Sir, we are extremely happy to have you for the special lecture and we are honored by your presence. On behalf of Karnataka State Law University, I extend a warm and a cordial welcome to you, sir. Welcome, sir. We have Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor P. Ishwar Bhatt, an eminent scholar and well-known academician as president of today's program. On behalf of Karnataka State Law University's Law School, I extend a cordial welcome to our Honorable Vice Chancellor. I extend a warm and a cordial welcome to our esteemed uh, syndicate and academic council members. A hearty welcome to Mr. Mohammad Zubair, Registrar of the University, who has always wholeheartedly supported all the endeavors of our law school. I also extend a cordial welcome to Professor G.B. Patil, Registrar Evaluation, and Professor C.S. Patil, former Dean. A warm and sincere welcome to all the esteemed principals and teachers of our affiliated law colleges and other law colleges and all the esteemed invitees who have joined today's program. 
Uh, we have been very fortunate to be backed by a team of uh, very motivated and dedicated faculty. I extend a hearty welcome to the faculty coordinators, Dr. Rajendra, Dr. Sunil, Sri I.B. Biradar, and also all of our dear faculty members and dear students to this uh, today's special lecture. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Thank you so much, ma'am. I also extend a hearty welcome to Professor Ratna Varan Gauder, Dean Thank KSLU you, and Director Thank KSLU. You. Now I request Dr. Rajendra Kumar Hitangi, Assistant Professor, KSLU Law School, to kindly introduce the resource person. Please, sir. Good morning to all the dignitaries and participants of today's online special lecture on the basic structure doctrine in Indian constitutional law, genesis, nonsense, and perils. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our resource person of today's special lecture, Sri V. Sudesh Pai. Sir is a distinguished lawyer, jurist, and an acclaimed author. Sir has specialized in constitutional law and administrative law. Having obtained a master's degree in mathematics and a degree in law with the highest marks in the university in constitutional law and administrative law, he started the general practice of law over 37 years ago, joining the chambers of the Doyen of the Bar late Sri S.D. Sundaras Swami, renowned senior advocate and former advocate general, Karnataka. His law practice covers different branches of law, mainly civil, constitutional, and administrative law. He was also a government advocate, High Court of Karnataka, from 1999 to 2006, and handled important and sensitive litigation on behalf of the state. Sir has appeared for and advised various institutions like universities, banks, PSUs, companies, etc. Sir is a member of the Indian Law Institute, New Delhi, and the Karnataka section of the International Commission of Jurists. Sir has assisted Dr. Durga Das Basu, the world-renowned uh, world commentator on com constitutional law, in the revision of his commentary on the Constitution, Constitution of India from 1993 till Dr. Basu's passing away in 1997. He's a contributor to the restatement of Indian law on legislative privileges, a project of the Supreme Court. Sir was a visiting chair professor Ashutosh Mukherjee Chair at the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata. He has been a resource person at the National Judicial Academy, Bhopal, for continuing legal education for judges. Sir is associated, associated with the Law Commission of Karnataka uh, as a senior research scholar. He has participated in several seminars and presented papers and authored articles on different subjects. He's also, he has also contributed to the New Indian Express uh, his contribution to academics, particularly in the area of critical constitutional analysis, has been substantial and significant. The Supreme Court and the High Courts have quoted from his writings. His works include Lessons in Law, Our Great Phobias, 2012, Working of the Constitution, Checks and Balances, 2014, The Judicial World of Multisplendid Genius, Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee, and Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee's Judicial World Through Judgments two volumes. A judge non parel a, a BK Mukherjee reader in 2016, Constitutional Supremacy, a revisit, a sage on constitutionalism, rule of law, and constitutional adjudication in 2019, Justice M. N. Venkata Chalaya, the man and the judge, a Venkata Chalaya reader, 2021. To quote from Chief Justice Venkata Chalaya's foreword uh, to uh, Sir's book, Constitutional Supremacy, uh, revisit, I quote, Shirvai took upon himself his enormous task of educating the schoolmen of the spirit of constitutionalism. Shirvai's work is monumental. Sudish Pai, an accomplished lawyer and jurist, belongs to the same distinguished class. I unquote. Sir, we are delighted to have you as a resource person. Uh, we are indeed grateful to you, sir, for accepting our invitation to deliver a special lecture today. Sir, thank you. With this, I conclude. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. May I request Sri V. Sudish Pai to kindly address us on the topic, the basic structure doctrine in the Indian constitutional law, genesis, nuances, and perils. Please, sir. Esteemed Vice Chancellor, Professor Ishwar Bhatt, members of the Syndicate, Senate, Academic Council, faculty, 
of the Karnataka State Law University and its affiliated colleges, students, and all those who have joined online for this program. Good morning to all. I'm extremely happy and humbled to be with you this morning to share a few thoughts on a subject of immense interest and importance, the basic structure doctrine. In speaking on today's topic, adapting the language of Justice Frankfurter, I say, I come to you with more questions than answers. The answers to the problems of an art are in its exercise. I shall endeavor to speak on how and why the doctrine was conceived and evolved, what is its genesis and what are the pitfalls, and I believe there are quite a few. The Constitution in Part 3 guarantees fundamental rights which are justiciable. The right to property was a fundamental right in Article 19.1f until it was deleted in 1979. And Article 31 provided that there could not be an acquisition saved by authority of law on a payment of just compensation. Part 4 sets out the directive principles which are the goals to be achieved by a welfare state. Article 13 forbids the making of any law which takes away or abridges fundamental rights. It also ordains that any existing laws to the extent of their inconsistency with Part 3 would be void. Article 368 provides for amendment to the Constitution. That is a constituent part. Now, the objective of the Constitution makers, inspired by the freedom movement, was to usher in an egalitarian society by bringing about socio-economic reforms. Agrarian reforms were high on the government agenda. With this in view, land reforms legislation was dropped. This came into conflict with the fundamental right to property and courts declared as unconstitutional various land reforms legislations as offending the right to property. The judiciary appeared as a stumbling block to the on the road to social transformation. The political executive had to respond, keeping in view its promises and the public sentiment. Parliament, which was then the provisional parliament, in the first general election in 1952, who were members of the Constituent Assembly, enacted the Constitution First Amendment in 1951. To shield agrarian reforms and other nationalization schemes. Then switch off my dear on my dear. It also brought in the device of scheduled land. Immunized laws into therein from any challenge on the ground that it infringes any of the fundamental rights. In Shankari Prasad, in 1951, the Supreme Court held that Parliament's constituent power certainly included the power to amend fundamental rights and law in Article 13 refers only to ordinary legislation and not constitutional law. However, in matters regarding compensation, the court ruled that in spite of Articles 31A and 31B, an attack on the ground that compensation provided was inadequate, so inadequate as to be illusory, was not barred. In a challenge to laws relating to urban development not covered by Articles 31 A and B, the court held that compensation meant full market value. The Constitution Fourth Amendment provided that adequacy of compensation was not justiciable. In spite of it, in the bank nationalization case, the court held compensation as the word compensation was there in Article 31 2, it would mean full compensation. <laughs> Prasad was followed in Sajan Singh in 1965, but doubts were expressed about the legal position by Justice Hidayatullah and Justice Mudolka. 
then came Golaknath in 1967, in which the Supreme Court, by a majority of six to five, held that Parliament had no power to take away or abridge any of the fundamental rights and law in Article 13 included a constitution amendment and therefore the inhibitions in Article 13.2 applied to constitution amendments as well. The effect of the judgments of the Supreme Court in the view it took to, of the right to property and to receive full compensation was, in a sense, similar to the impact of the judgments of the United States Supreme Court during the heyday of the substantive due process, when the court gave full play to freedom of contract and the right to property. The net result was a kind of confrontation between the judiciary, which was seen as supporting vested interests and parliament, which appeared to be represent, which re represented the populace and appeared to be keen about reforms and progress. To overcome the Golaknath judgment, the Constitution 24th Amendment specifically provided that Article 13 would not apply to constitutional amendments, which means that an amendment to the Constitution would not be susceptible to a challenge on the ground that infringed fundamental rights. The title of Article 368, Procedure for Amendment, was changed to power of parliament to amend the constitution and procedure therefore. It was also clarified that an amendment under 368 would not come within the purview of Article 13. The constitution 25th amendment replaced the word compensation with the word amount in Article 31.2 to place beyond doubt that compensation was not justiciable. The stage was now set for the biggest and most significant constitutional case in India's history, the largest bench hearing for the maximum number of days and writing the longest judgment, Keshwan and the Bharti. The challenge was to the Constitution 24th, 25th and 29th Amendments. By the 29th Amendment, certain land reforms laws of Kerala were included in Schedule 9. The court was faced with an unenviable task. Golaknath appeared to have laid down too wide and too wild a proposition, which was clearly unsupportable and had to go. The court wanted to save the constitution from what was alleged and what the majority also believed to be onslaughts on the constitution. Now, we first come across the idea of basic features in the context of, con of a constitution and constitution amendment in the judgment of Chief Justice Cornelius of Pakistan in Faslul Qadar Chaudhry was as Muhammad Abdul Haq in 1963, where he took the view that though the Pakistan president under the 1956 constitution was empowered to remove difficulties, he had no power to remove a fundamental feature of the constitution. Shortly thereafter, in October 1964, Justice Budolkar, in his separate opinion in Sajjan Singh, observed whether the basic features of the constitution should be given a permanency and whether making a change in the basic features can be regarded merely as an amendment or would it in effect be rewriting the constitution. Almost immediately thereafter, in February 1965, Professor Conrad, the head of the Department of Law of the University of Heidelberg in West Germany, delivered a lecture at the law faculty of the Benares Hindu University on implied limitations on the amending power. India's great constitutional lawyer, M. K. Nambiar, is the father of the present Attorney General Sri Venugopal, borrowed this from the professor and presented it to the Supreme Court in Golaknath case. The court did not, however, express any opinion in that behalf and decided the case on a narrower basis in February 1967. Then there was also an article by Professor Conrad limitation of amendment procedures and the constituent power. The seed that was planted by Dr. Conrad, adopted in the arguments of the redoubtable Nambiar in Golaknath, was brought to flower and fruition by the impassioned advocacy and forensic brilliance of Nani Palkiwala in Keshwananda Bharti. It is against the backdrop of the foregoing that the issue of the basic structure of the constitution arose and the court desperately evolved 
the basic structure doctrine, which while holding that amendment to any part of the constitution, including part three was permissible, sought to rein in that part by declaring that such amendment should not destroy the basic features, framework, or structure of the constitution. Now, what the basic structure is, is for the court to decide as and when situations arise and cases present themselves. The purported view of the majority as signed by nine of the 13, nine judges of the 13th bench was this, Article 368 does not enable parliament to alter the basic structure of framework of the constitution. The special bench declared the law in these terms. The challenge to various constitution amendments was repelled, except that the second part of Article 31C, which made the declaration thereunder non-justiciable, was held to offend the basic structure. Commenting on these developments, Granville Austin, in his working of a democratic constitution, remarked, the nine judges who signed the summary of the Keshwananda judgment seem to have performed an act of statesmanship, even of legitimate. The court mollified the government by overruling Golakna and upholding the three constitution amendments, in effect, nearly returning to Shankari Prasad, while preserving, indeed strengthening its own power of judicial review. The history of Golaknath is a cautionary tale of unintended consequences. The fears for civil liberty and for institutions of the constitution that fed that decision's rigid restrictions on amendment evoked amendments hazarding liberty and the constitution as their use during Mrs. Gandhi's emergency soon would demonstrate. The amendments in their turn produced Keshwananda which entrenched the fundamental rights as even the Constituent Assembly had not done while strengthening the courts under the Constitution." Court. Now, if we go back to the fundamentals, the Constitution in Article 368 vests amending power in Parliament and prescribes the manner of its exercise. This is Constituent power. Where the Constitution provides for its own amendment, it cannot be amended in any other manner short of a revolution. Dr. Ambedkar, the chairman of the drafting committee, speaking in the Constituent Assembly had said, if the future parliament wishes to amend any particular article, all that is necessary for them is to have a th two thirds majority. The entire tenor of the Constituent Assembly debates was that all articles of the constitution were subject to the amendatory process, as Justice Khanna also notes in his Keshwananda judgment. And in the earliest case of Shankari Prasad, Chief Just Justice Patanjali Shastri, speaking for a unanimous bench, which considered the challenge to the first amendment declared in bringing tones, to make a law which contravenes the constitution constitutionally valid is a matter of constitutional amendment and as such, it falls within the exclusive power of parliament." Unquote. Yet for the first time in Keshwananda, the court, by a slender majority of seven is to six, declared that while parliament had the power to amend any part of the constitution, including fundamental rights, and there were no implied limitations on the amending power, yet the power did not extend to amending the basic structure of the constitution, a term which is not found in the constitution. No court until then had asserted a power to annul a constitution amendment on the basis of such a nebulous concept and one which originated from the court itself, a judicial innovation and a bold one at that. Six judges held that the amending power was limited by various inherent and implied limitations. Six others held that there was no limitation on the amending power. Justice Khanna, expressly the 13th judge expressly rejected the theory of inherent or implied limitations and held the amending power was plenary yet he held that the word amendment by its limited connotation did not permit abrogating the constitution and therefore subject to retention of the basic structure any part of it could be amended 
it is seen that there is no common ground on the reasoning for limitation on the amending power between Justice Khanna and the other six judges in the majority. Indeed, there appears to be an unbridgeable gap between their concepts and lines of reasoning. The idea of the impermissibility to alter the basic framework of the Constitution was picked up and adopted from the judgment of Justice Khanna. It is inconceivable how this could be said to be the view of the majority. Equally, if not more incomprehensible, is the reasoning and the conclusion that though there are no implied limitations on the power of amendment, it could still be restricted or curtailed only on the basis of the meaning of the word amend, which in plain English means nothing else but change or, or alter and no qualifications or limitations in her in that word or in its meaning. The Keshwan and the judgment, of course, salvaged something precious, but one cannot test or justify the juristic foundation of a concept based on a result, however beneficial or alluring. The doctrine was applied, accepted and applied for the first time in Indira Gandhi versus Raj Narayan, and then in Minerva Mills, where Chief Justice Chandrachur said, amend as you may, even the solemn document which the founding fathers have committed to your care, for you know best the needs of your generation. But the constitution is a precious heritage. You cannot destroy its identity. This is the theme song of the basic structure doctrine. This then is the genesis and the purport of this doctrine. Thereafter, the theory has been invoked and applied in many cases, some justifiably, some indiscriminately, and some wholly unjustifiably, which would mean that it was an appropriation or a misappropriation of judicial power by the judiciary. When you try to understand and define basic structure and dwell upon the doctrine, difficulties arise. Is there a match between the label and the thing? T.S. Eliot once said, when a term has become so universally sanctified as democracy now is, I begin to wonder whether it means anything in meaning too many things. I'm afraid much the same can be said about the basic structure. The basic structure doctrine is the only substantive ground of attack against a constitutional amendment. It is unavailing as a ground of judicial review of ordinary legislation and certainly not of executive action. The two powers, constituent and legislative, operate in different fields and subject to different limitations as was held in the Indira Gandhi case. Ordinary laws can be invalidated only if they are beyond the legislative competence of the legislature or are violative of part three or any other constitutional limitation. This has been the consistent trend of the Supreme Court decisions reiterated by a seven judge bench in state of Karnataka and then in Vaman Rao and Bhim Singh Ji, except for some untenable drift somewhere. In Bhim Singh Ji, Justice Krishnaya emphatically held the question of basic structure being breached cannot arise when we examine the virus of an ordinary law as distinguished from a constitutional amendment. Indeed, if there was any doubt about this proposition, the question was specifically put in issue, discussed, and the position was unequivocally reiterated in Kuldip Nair versus Union of India in 2006, where the first 18 paragraphs of the unanimous judgment of the Constitution bench, Chief Justice Sabarwal, speaking for the bench, reiterated this position. This is also evident from the operative portion of the judgment in Koilo's case, again reaffirmed in Ashok Kumar Thakur and the first Madras Bar Association case. Quite surprisingly, in spite of all this settled legal position, the majority opinion in the second Madras Bar Association case, it was very casually stated by a constitution bench, most unfortunately, that the basic structure doctrine will apply to invalidate ordinary legislation too. This was assumed to be a logical extension of a principle. The same learned judge, Justice Kehar, reiterated that view of his in his leading judgment in the most infamous NJAC case. Fortunately, the other judges did not take this view and one of the majority judges, Justice Madan Lokur, expressly held that the statute cannot be challenged on the ground it violates the
the Constitution's basic structure. That an ordinary law should pass the test of basic structure is non sequitur and mere ipsy dixit. It is governed by, to use Palkiwala's picturesque language, what is lazily assumed or hastily glimpsed or piously hoped. It furnishes a typical example of what Lord Denman called law taken for granted, law which cannot be traced to any competent authority or clear legal principle. He said this in R versus O'Connell in 1844. But then, does not this vice hit and vitiate the very doctrine? Does the doctrine have any juristic foundations? Was there an issue in Keshwananda that parliament has no power to alter the basic structure? Can the purported summary signed by nine judges reflect the majority view? These issues will continue to trouble any student of law. The recent data for the basic structure apparently is that every measure or action, executive or legislative, has to conform to the limits set by the Constitution. It's open to challenge and judicial scrutiny on recognized grounds. A legislation can be assailed only on the ground of lack of legislative competence or violation of fundamental rights or any other constitutional limitation. But then the Indian parliament exercises not only executive power, I'm sorry, not only legislative power, while acting under Article 368, parliament exercises constituent power. And the product of such exertion is an amendment to the constitution, which is not amenable to substantive challenge on other grounds which are recognized for challenging a law. It is to ensure that the process that by the process of amendment, the constitution is not denuded of its core or made to suffer a loss of identity that the doctrine of basic structure has been judicially conceived and evolved as a substantive and only ground to challenge an amendment to the constitution. Few constitutional issues, it is rightly said, can be presented in black and white. They are not matters of icy certainty. In law, particularly constitutional law, there are no absolutes. Differences of degree imperceptibly merge into differences of kind. But as Justice Matthew said, a trained judicial perception would be capable of discerning the nuances and which of the gradations make genuine difference. The doctrine of basic structure is wisely and well advisedly confined to challenge of a constitutional amendment, otherwise it would open a Pandora's box, it would pervert the constitutional scheme. Indeed, it may not be wrong to say that invoking the basic structure doctrine to test the validity of ordinary legislation would amount by itself to undermining and destroying the constitution's basic structure. As Justice Krishnayar beautifully put it, the constitutional fascination for the basic structure doctrine cannot be made a Trojan horse to penetrate the entire legislative camp. Now by its very name and reason that the basic structure is to ensure that the core of the constitution is not destroyed or abrogated, the basic structure and the touchstone of testing constitutional amendments is and must necessarily be what is contained in the original constitution and not what is added later either by an amendment or by judicial gloss or interpretation and whose legitimacy and correctness itself may be in serious doubt. The basic structure can only relate to what is contained in the constitution. Thus, when an amendment to the constitution is challenged as damaging the basic structure, it would have to be tested with reference to what the constitution originally said. It would have and not with reference to judgments or later interpretations, or else the basic structure will not be basic but fluctuating. This was the cardinal error in the NJAC case. The Supreme Court tested the amendment not on the basis of what Article 124 originally said, but what was judicially evolved and the judicial gloss put on it by the second judge's case. A working test for what is basic structure 
was involved in Indira Gandhi's case, in Vaman Rao's case, and in Bhim Singh Ji's case. In some later cases, it was also the principle of arching, overarching principles were also evolved. Now it is not only fundamental rights in part three, but many other aspects of the constitution also form part of the basic structure. There can be abrogation of the basic structure even in cases where fundamental rights are not engaged. For example, a constitution amendment which violates principles like federalism, democracy, parliamentary form of government, which have all been held to be basic features, would be destructive of the basic structure and hence invalid, even though it does not infringe any particular provision of part three. Thus, a constitution amendment may violate some provisions of part three, but may not necessarily be destructive of the basic structure, where it may also happen that it abrogates the basic structure without infringing part three. The expression basic features, basic structure, basic framework have all been interchangeably employed. For the first time in his dissent in NJAC, Justice Chalveshwar gave an either dimension and with respect rightly so, distinguishing basic features from basic structure or framework. The two, I, the two expressions convey two different ideas. Basic features are the components of the basic structure. The basic structure is the sum total of the basic features. As to when the abrogation of a particular basic feature can be said to destroy the basic structure depends upon the nature of that basic feature sought to be amended and the context of the amendment. That cannot be any universally applicable test regarding all basic features. In law, context is everything. Is a very profound observation of Lord Steen in 2002 appeal cases. In the famous case of R versus Daly, speaking for the House of Lords. It is interesting to note that before any of these judgments, way back in 1974 itself, Palkiwala, in his book, A Constitution Defaced and Defiled, stated, the principle that the basic structure or framework of the Constitution cannot be altered gives a wider scope to the amending power than the principle that none of the essential features can be damaged or destroyed. Now it is begging the question whether the doctrine is implicit in the constitution or arises from the implications in the constitutional scheme. The meaning of the word constituent is authorized to make, frame, revise, alter a political constitution. And there is agreement among jurists and political scientists in adopting that meaning. In India, Article 368 deals with the constituent power and amendment to the constitution. It does not expressly entrench or withhold any part from the ambit of amendment. There is overwhelming consensus of judicial opinion as also scholastic writings, rejecting the doctrine of implied limitations on the amending power. The fact that, a const that an instrument like the Indian constitution drawn with such meticulous care and by men who so well understood how to make language fit their thoughts does not contain any such limiting phrase affecting the power and method of constitution amendment is persuasive evidence that no such limitation or qualification was intended. Now we always hear this oft quoted words of Chief Justice Hughes that the constitution is what the judges say it is. That was an observation made by him much before he was appointed a judge. But that is clarified by his pronouncement in Carter versus Carter Coal Company in 1936, where as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he observed, it is not the function of the court to amend the constitution by judicial decisions. As Justice Frankfurt observed, the ultimate touchstone of the constitutionality is the constitution itself, not what we have said about it. And nearer home, 
we should always bear in mind the admonition of Justice Bhagwati in the first judge's case. He said, we judges can always find some reason for mending the language of the constitution to our will if we want, but that would be rewriting the constitution in the guise of interpretation. This is a telling reminder to the judiciary. Equally profound is what Justice Black of the US Supreme Court said. The public welfare demands that constitutional cases must be decided according to the terms of the constitution itself and not according to judges' views of fairness, reasonableness, or justice. I have no fear of constitutional amendments properly adopted, but I do fear the rewriting of the constitution by the judges under the guise of interpretation. Now, even in Keshwananda, the six minority judges and Justice Khanna, therefore they constitute the majority, negative the theory of implied limitations. But the majority introduced the novel and amorphous sphere of entrenchment by judicially inventing the basic structure doctrine as constituting implied limitations. Jur jurisprudentially speaking, this erodes the legitimacy of the constitution. It has been rightly said the doctrine in some way made the, the Supreme, I'm sorry, made the Supreme Court, which is the guardian of the constitution, guardian over the constitution. The Keshwananda doctrine represents the high watermark of judicial innovation, curtailing parliament's amending power on some vague, evolving concept, incapable of defining, of definite or precise formulation and giving the judiciary a unique power of nullifying constitutional amendments. The basic structure doctrine shifts the emphasis of democratic constitutionalism. The major premise of the constitution is that what obtains is limited government. The constitution operates as a limitation upon all organs. The checks and balances of power in the constitutional scheme is perhaps the most important feature, most important and fundamental feature of all democratic institutions. Is that basic feature not breached by the basic structure doctrine? If constitutional government is limited government, one of its enemies is absolutism of any kind. The Keshwananda doctrine is indeed judicial ab absolutism or imperialism. The basic structure doctrine puts the Indian Supreme Court in the same position as the US Supreme Court of the substantive due process era in a different sense, not of supporting freedom of contract and property, but of arrogating unlimited authority to itself, which tends to become some amorphous general supervision of government. It is said the US Supreme Court will not abandon the notion despite demonstration of its utter illegitimacy, precisely because it is an ever-flowing fount of judicial power. So is it with the Supreme Court of India. The basic structure doctrine raises the issue of democratic character of judicial review in its most acute form. The doctrine is prima facie counter-majoritarian and proceeds on a distrust of the democratic process itself, which must undoubtedly be part of the basic structure. Democracy is a basic structure, but the doctrine has a mistrust for the democratic process. As Krishna, just as Krishna picturesquely said, mistrust of government is violative of the comity between instrumentalities. Suspicion is the upas tree under whose shade reason fails and justice dies. The doctrine, in effect, stifles democracy itself, a basic feature. It upsets the delicate balance between the different wings. It's no doubt true that judicial review is recognized and ordained by the constitution. Yet judicial review operates in a democratic setup and its counter-majoritarian character is reconciled with democratic principles on certain basic assumptions. And in judiciously exercising that power, the court can be regarded not as an adversary, but as an auxiliary to democracy. Now, judicial lawmaking in the fields of common law and interpretation is one thing, but to make or unmake constitutional changes for all time is quite a different thing altogether. That is the effect of the Keshwananda judgment. A judicial veto nullifies a constitution amendment and change for all times 
only for the reason that it is impermissible in the subjective view of the judges and there is no legal or constitutional means to reassert the popular will over the veto. The judiciary thus becomes the final and conclusive arbiter of any changes in the constitution and the necessity of desirability of the change. This is perhaps one of the greatest perils of the doctrine. Are judges capable of dealing with those wide considerations which address themselves only to the practical judgment and wisdom of a legislative body? Since Keshwananda, the court has been inventing constitutional limitations from supposed basic features, the list expanding according to the whim of each judge who takes a fancy to open the Pandora's box. And many times this is nothing more than judges erecting their prejudices and predilections into constitutional principles and shutting the door for change and reform. Time works changes and brings into existence new conditions and purposes. Every constitution is expected to endure for a long time. It must necessarily be elastic and flexible and should to be capable of change to suit the requirements of society as it changes and grows. It has been rightly said in the study, Endurance of National Constitutions, that one of the factors that helps the constitution endure is the flexibility of the amending process. And Professor Kenneth Weir had said in 1966, as the constitution originally stood, that the constitution of India has framed, struck a good balance in the matter of amendment. The problems of constitutional change and amendment are sometimes discussed as if the principal danger was that a tidal wave of majoritarianism may suppress or ride roughshod over the rights of the minority. It is worthwhile to note that the problem may arise equally where a majority of the people wish for a change but it could be prevented in the name of this doctrine and the supposed breach of a fanciful basic structure. This can tend to invite and justify disobedience when people despair of their institutions, force arrives masquerading as ideology. More rhetoric than legal reasoning characterizes the actual exercises of enabling the constitution amendments. It is naturally so, but the court is exercising a political judgment. Over the years, the Keshwananda doctrine, which was thought of and understood as the limited scope of judicial control by the basic structure doctrine, has been enlarged by subsequent pronouncements into a total ju judicial supremacy over the amending process. Now, the sign for known of a successful democracy is that all citizens think for themselves about all issues that may arise. The requirement of successful totalitarianism is that citizens obey those who think for them. The basic structure doctrine requires the people to abide by what the Supreme Court thinks is basic and essential for them. It may be that it is not unrealistic to doubt or despise political processes, but it would be naive to believe that guardianship is synonymous with democracy. It is the fear and distrust, perhaps not wholly misplaced, that gave rise to the doctrine. All the proponents of the theory were inspired by the need <clears throat> for salvaging the constitution from drastic changes. It was invented to shield the constitution from frequent and multiple amendments by a transient majority. But the juristic foundation of a concept cannot be built or allowed to rest on quicksand. As Dr. Basu says, viewing a theory from a juristic angle, we can be guided only by legal principles and not a priori considerations, however momentous they might be. It is equally settled that the possibility of abuse is not a ground to invalidate a power. The fear of perversion is no test of power. The answer to such apprehension is furnished by L. B. Oldfield in his classic work, Amending of the Federal Constitution, which Justice Khanna quoted in his Keshwananda judgment. Abuse of the amending power is an anomalous term. The proponents of implied limitations resort to the method of reductio ad absurdum in pointing out the abuses which might occur if there were no limitations on the power to amend. The amending power is a power of an altogether different kind from ordinary powers. If abuse occurs, it occurs in the hands of a special organization of the nation and of the states representing an extraordinary majority of people so that for all practical purposes, it may be said to be the people, or at least their highest agent, 
and one exercising sovereign powers. The people merely take the consequences of their own acts, unquote. Justice Khanna point himself pointed out, and with respect very rightly, that the best safeguard against the abuse or extravagant use of power is public opinion, and not a fetter on the right of the people's representatives to change the constitution by following the procedure laid down by the constitution itself. And as been so often said, the legislatures are guardians of the liberties and welfare of the people in quite as great a degree as the judiciary. He went on to say that if a climate is created wherein cherished values lose their significance, then in such an event, a restricted interpretation of Article 368 would not save the people from political enslavement, social stagnation, or mental servitude. In spite of having said this, the judgment was otherwise. Birdwick, in his Law of the American Constitution, points out that the American Congress has not supplanted the Constitution, not because there are implied limitations upon the amending power, but because of the fear of public resistance. It is only public opinion acting upon the amending body which places any check on the amending power. Any other view would enable the court to veto the will of the people expressed in a Constitution amendment without any possibility of the reversal of the court's action except through revolution, God forbid. It's important to note that Professor Conrad's thesis was greatly influenced by the entrenched provisions in certain European constitutions. The Swiss constitution in Article 118 provides for both partial and total revision, and a total revision can be made only after a nationwide referendum. Article 89 of the Constitution of France prohibits amendment prejudicial to the integrity of the territory of the Republic form of government. In the Federal Republic of Germany, Article 79.3 makes inadmissible any amendment affecting the division of the Federation, participation of states in legislation, and the basic principles laid down in Articles 1 and Article 20. Thus, these constitutions expressly declare certain provisions as basic and make them unamendable. Indeed, it is not a case of any implication or implied limitation, but express entrenchment. Such is clearly not the case with the Constitution of India and Article 368. When the Constitution is provided for its amendment without any reservation, the mere gravity of the subject of amendment cannot give rise to an implied limitation. We Indians as a nation seem to be obsessed with judicial salvation. That is our problem. Appeal to the judiciary for nullifying constitutional amendments demonstrates the belief that judicial power alone can cure the misuse of constituent power. One cannot forget that during the internal emergency, the court failed to protect the liberties of the people. It is the people and the people's representatives who ended the emergency and corrected the misuse of constituent power. The 42nd Amendment was repealed and the 44th Amendment brought in. We recall Palkiwala's insightful words that the people must get away from the fallacy of the legal solubility of all problems. Indeed, he reminded us that Buddha's last words to his disciples, look not for refuge to anyone besides yourselves, come home with a strange poignancy. Now successive judgments have simply proceeded on the basis that Keshwananda held that an amendment to the constitution cannot be made to alter the basic structure. And this has expanded in a manner which was perhaps never foreseen by its authors. Tempton and Dyarjuna said that it is doubtful if even its ablest and most vocal exponent, Nani Palkiwala, really argued for this outcome when he espoused implied limitations on parliament's amending power. The doctrine has become a constitutional axiom and has passed in the currency of legal and political thinking. It has become the modern political superstition, to use the language of Herbert Spencer, who said in the 19th century, the great political superstition of the past was the divine right of kings. The great political superstition of the present is the divine right of parliament. And I would add, now the great political superstition is the doctrine of the basic structure. Such general acquiescence does not detract from the fact that the theory rests 
on fragile foundation of an unexamined and assumed ratio. Time does not run in favor of validity. It is worthwhile to remind ourselves of the wholesome exhortation of Justice Cardoso. The half-truths of one generation tend at times to perpetuate themselves in law as the whole truths of another, when constant repetition brings it about that qualifications taken once for granted are discarded or forgotten. And this is what is happening to this doctrine as well. At the end of the day, what is the concept and content of the basic structure doctrine? It is not to be a twinkling star, but a terrestrial concept having its habitat in the constitution. Ideas and concepts which may be easily identified like secularism, federalism, republican form of government. But then, what is the precise of some of the so-called overarching principles, concept, <coughs> concepts like supremacy of the constitution, rule of law, and so on. <clears throat> there is no objective standard for such political concepts in the constitution. It's the judiciary to determine and fix the vague contours of such principles and limit the people's right to amend the constitution. This is the fundamental and unanswered question in the judicial appropriation of such a vast power from Keshwananda onwards. Having said all this, I'm conscious of the fact that the basic structure doctrine is a product of its time and history. Having, in in pla having been in place for almost half a century, it may be difficult and perhaps even imprudent to dislodge it or even make such a suggestion. The doctrine is neither an unalloyed blessing nor an unmitigated disaster. Like many other tools, it has to be judiciously and cautiously employed. It's a rare weapon to be used sparingly. Unjustified and indiscriminate invocation and application of the basic structure doctrine will itself be an abrogation of the Constitution's basic structure. We cannot avoid what Cardoso deemed inherent in the problem of construction and in constitutional exposition even more, that making a choice between uncertainties, we must be content to choose the lesser. And Justice Krishnaya's warning in Ambika Prasad bears recall. It's fundamental that the nation's constitution is not kept in constant uncertainty by judicial review every season because it paralyzes by perennial suspense all legislative and administrative action on vital issues deterred by the brooding threat of forensic blood. The basic structure doctrine prohibits amendment to the constitution in such a manner that would destroy its basic structure or framework. Now what is basic and immutable is the all-important question. It is submitted that what is given by the Constitution can be taken away. But certain human rights and fundamental freedoms, like the life to life, life, to life and liberty, human dignity, and so on, are not the gift of any law or the Constitution. They are recognized by the Constitution. Without such recognition, the Constitution itself would be incomplete. What is not a gift of the constitution, but is something which inheres in every person is immutable. And I would submit beyond the reach of the constituent power. It is such rights or concepts which are basic and cannot be abrogated. That, however, I'm sure is the position in any civilized polity, even in the absence of the Keshwananda doctrine. But constitutions can also be extra legal or even illegal. Is the United States of America breaking away from Britain and setting up an independent state and constitution strictly legal? One cannot wish away a revolution either by a constitutional exhortation or a judicial fiat. 
while one may fetter the powers of the legal sovereign, parliament exercising constituted power, can the political sovereign, the people, be fettered? These issues of great moment will continue to keep us engrossed. The debate about the desirability and tenability of the basic structure doctrine will continue to engage the lawyer and the layman alike. And Nani Palkiwala's stellar contribution to our ju constitutional jurisprudence will always be constantly and gratefully remembered. One may derive some comfort from a profound thought. I quote, the basic dilemmas of art and law are in the end not dissimilar and in their resolution, the resolution of passion and pattern, of frenzy and form, of convention and revolt, of order and spontaneity, lies the clue to creativity that will endure. Thank you all for your patience and courtesy. Thank you so much for an enlightening address, sir. May I now request Professor Dr. P. Ishwar Bhatt, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Karnataka State Law University, to kindly deliver the presidential remarks. Please, sir. Sri Suresh Bhai, very eminent jurist, who has authored a number of uh, uh, classical and uh, very important works. You know, various uh, 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 ways, either in newspapers or in uh, books or articles or uh, you know various uh, methods or you know through his lectures, he has enriched uh, the constitutional jurisprudence uh, by his own uh, analysis and uh, contribution. He has uh, taken a, a very radical stand that. Uh, Basic structure uh, theory has uh, done something uh, uh, which is uh, not in keeping with the spirit of uh, the constitution, especially when uh, basic structure theory is applied to examine the validity of uh, legislation or validity of executive action, or uh, even about the uh, application of uh, basic structure theory on a uh, the judicial gloss or uh, the constitutional development that has taken place uh, through judicial gloss, as in a uh, uh, NJAC case, etc., he finds uh, that as uh, problematic. He also finds basic structure theory problematic for the reason that uh, there is uh, no appropriate uh, method which uh, one can uh, assess what is a uh, basic structure basic structure, basic feature, different uh, uh, vocabularies are used. Uh, of course, uh, to identify basic structure violation, so the tests that are employed are also problematic. That's a identity test uh, or uh, the feature test. That, that is a bit of problematic. And for that purpose, the judiciary evolved another uh, uh, method that is uh, employing uh, the golden trend. In a Yam Nagaraj case, the court considered that uh, if the constitutional amendment is uh, going against uh, the golden triangle, then uh, it ought to be regarded as a validity of uh, the BC structure. So, about uh, the methods that are employed for uh, identification of a uh, BC structure. There is a uh, uncertainty or a, there, there is a, some a confusion. There is a judicial difficulty also. Uh, about a theor theoretical uh, uh, basis for a basic uh, structure uh, doctrine, uh, of course, in a Keshwananda case, the court considered that uh, uh, there are certain uh, unamendable, eternal, and permanent features of uh, the constitution which should be kept uh, beyond the reach of uh, the amending power on the part of uh, the parliament. Because uh, to protect the constitutional values for the future is uh, 
something to be done by keeping in mind the purpose of the constitution and the consequence of uh, the constitution if uh, the consequence of the constitution is uh, to ensure that uh, there will be continuation of uh, this uh, basic values then by keeping in mind uh, the purpose uh, to decide whether uh, the concern uh, amendment is appropriate or not see instead of uh, so so many confusions and difficulties during a period of uh, 49 years the keshon on the judgment has uh, been applied and uh, it is in force now can we they reject the basic structure doctrine altogether in indira gandhi case or in uh, some other subsequent cases it is a basic structure theory which uh, came to the rescue of uh, the constitution in order to protect the constitution basic structure theory had to be applied otherwise uh, uh, what was the method through which article 329a of the constitution i mean amendment brought through 39th amendment uh, could be under whether uh, everything is to be left to the parliament itself it is true that uh, the errors of uh, 42nd amendment and errors of uh, 39th amendment are uh, undone by 43rd and 44th amendment of course uh, to that extent uh, the legislature can also be interested with the responsibility of uh, protecting the constitution judiciary is uh, not the sole body to protect the constitution the legislature is also able to protect the constitution and ultimately it is the people who will be protecting the constitution see we find that a uh, basic structure doctrine has uh, traveled to other jurisdictions as well it has uh, traveled to bangladesh pakistan sri lanka or uh, for the african countries and uh, in a uh, canada also you know the secession reference case and other cases uh, it has been uh, put into application because uh, when uh, the eternal values underlying the constitution are at a, at a stake or uh, when uh, they are threatened by the constitution I mean, then a uh, judiciary has to evolve certain strategy and uh, that strategy may have certain difficulties uh, of course uh, application of a basic structure theory to examine the validity of a ninth scheduled legislations is a bit of problematic uh, because uh, one will be going to the validity of uh, that uh, legislation but uh, it becomes inevitable because uh, when a higher norm like a constitutional amendment uh, can be examined in the light of a basic structure of time why not a ordinary legal norm uh, see uh, upendra bakshi criticizes uh, that uh, approach of uh, distinguishing between the uh, constitutional amendment and the legislation in so far as the application of basic structure theory is concerned once we accept a basic structure theory then uh, it ought to be applied to the constitution i mean constitutional amendments as well as the ordinary legislations uh, because uh, the spirit underlying uh, the constitution is also the basis upon which uh, the uh, legislate the validity of the legislation can be examined of course uh, that has a certain difficulty but uh, when the uh, ninth schedule combines the constitutional protection with the legislative norm there is a, a peculiar situation where uh, ordinary legislation put into ninth schedule will have to be tested under the touchstone of a basic structure why that set of legislation is to be distinguished from other legislations which are not subject to which are not given that a ninth schedule protection see uh, logically from uh, the kelsenian uh, principle or kelsenian angle it is possible to say that when a constitution constitutional amendment these to form a grand norm and uh, uh, when a judiciary evolves a proposition that uh, that can be uh, tested or that can be interpreted of course uh, 
when uh, the original constitution is uh, interpreted that's also a kind of a judicial amendment today the term uh, procedure established by law is uh, not uh, the same as uh, that was uh, meant in a uh, ak gopalan case or uh, uh, the or when uh, the constitution makers had enacted uh, or when uh, the constituent assembly uh, uh, members express uh, their views about uh, the procedure established by law the uh, judicial amendments are there and uh, when a uh, judicial amendments uh, in the form of uh, such a uh, activist interpretations are subsequently to be altered or uh, they are to be changed again uh, through application of uh, there is a uh, methods of interpretation historical analytical textual uh, then a uh, purposive interpretation structural interpretation all these uh, principles are to be employed and ultimately uh, eclecticism or a uh, uh, application of a pragmatic approach among uh, different uh, types of interpretations which uh, interpretation can be considered as uh, the most appropriate ultimately that is to be chosen because interpretation is uh, nothing but choice among a uh, different uh, or uh, alternative meanings and uh, alternative meanings are there which alternative which particular meaning we regard as a most appropriate from that angle one has to choose then whether during the last uh, 48 of or 49 years uh, keshavananda case has uh, remained only in the, the uh, book constitutional law book or whether it has uh, percolated to the sphere of uh, public opinion we find that uh, uh, it has a uh, come to the level of a uh, people's understanding it is a part of uh, our uh, uh, social system and uh, when uh, the society has a particular structure it it has a uh, three layers there's a value structure uh, intellectual structure and infrastructure structure then value structure which uh, uh, stands at the top of uh, the social structure should be in a position to control the intellectual structure as well as the uh, infrastructure if there is uh, any kind of a disturbance uh, in those spheres the value structure liberty justice equality fraternity all those uh, values those will be coming to the help of uh, uh, either judiciary or any other uh, authority to ensuring that balance uh, could be maintained within the constitutional framework whether this kind of a social structure which has a three layers can be correlated with the basic structure doctrine whether a basic structure doctrine has a sociological basis is it accepted by the society is it a, a something a recognized by the common people uh, in the last five decades it appears that basic structure doctrine has uh, come to stay but there are certain difficulties about identification there is a difficulty about its application to the field of uh, legal norms certain uh, greater care is to be taken and uh, 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 of course about uh, its application to executive action again it is a uh, problematic because uh, Uh, if the judiciary arrives at a conclusion that a, a particular exercise of executive act, say imposition of a precedent rule, is a, in violation of a basic structure of a, the constitution and hence it is to be struck down as a invalid, then it becomes a unwieldy and a judiciary is not able to use appropriate tool with which it can decide. that uh, in this particular say, case there is a violation of a basic structure i uh, really agree with the uh, uh, shri sudish pai every eminent uh, jurist who has uh, made a, a very uh, elaborate study in depth study about uh, the whole doctrine and he has uh, come out with a very cogent uh, uh, reasoning and uh, uh, he has uh, 
It's just the NJC case in a, one of our, the uh, articles. Um, of course, uh, that approach uh, is also providing some light. And uh, we have to uh, examine the basis structure uh, doctrine or this uh, part of uh, constitutional jurisprudence uh, uh, more uh, carefully uh, because uh, uh, there are uh, areas of uh, confusion, there are certain gaps. But uh, on the other hand, social acceptance or political acceptance of uh, that doctrine has uh, uh, come to stay. I mean, um, it is a part of uh, the reality uh, because uh, uh, in a Indira Gandhi case or in a subsequent cases, whenever a, uh, in a such a constitutional amendment is uh, uh, attempted or when it is uh, defended or when it is uh, politically debated, the political parties or uh, various other uh, uh, persons will be looking from uh, the angle of a uh, basic structure doctrine because it is a part and parcel of our uh, constitutional jurisprudence. Uh, yes, this is uh, my personal view. Uh, I'm uh, examining from uh, the perspective of uh, uh, the perspective of uh, uh, social acceptance of uh, this theory or uh, social transformation through this theory. Because uh, uh, certain parts of uh, the constitutional amendments, which uh, cannot be accepted, uh, may be read down. We, we come across so, so many such instances. They are read down and uh, reading down in the light of uh, the constitutional uh, uh, values. There is uh, something attempted in uh, uh, certain cases. But in uh, some other cases, uh, there is uh, an approach of uh, looking to cultural pluralism also and uh, approving the constitutional amendment. For example, in a uh, Podial case, cultural pl pluralism was one of uh, the factors on the basis of which uh, the court uh, considered that uh, it is uh, in accordance with the basic feature of the constitution. But uh, the other judge, Sharma, appears to be more uh, uh, convincing uh, because uh, uh, his reasoning is uh, quite uh, logical. Uh, see, part extent uh, recognition of a particular religious uh, leader or religious uh, entity like a uh, uh, yes a buddhist lama a lama group would be considered as a, an appropriate thing uh, for and whether uh, that kind of a constitutional amendment uh, can also be regarded as in accordance with the basic structure of the constitution that uh, judgment was uh, written by honorable justice uh, amendment uh, but uh, we have to rethink about uh, the uh, method of application or uh, about uh, the tools that are uh, employed for the purpose of uh, uh, basic structure scrutiny. Uh, these are uh, my personal views. Uh, the scholarly view uh, put forward by uh, our uh, uh, chief guest, very learned man, the field of uh, constitutional law, is something that we have to uh, consider uh, quite uh, uh, seriously. And uh, so the uh, difficulties that have come across in this sphere are to be uh, overcome with a more systematic uh, method of uh, uh, treating the whole subject like a each system set of time. Uh, uh, these are my ob uh, observations, but uh, uh, it was an excellent uh, uh, presentation by, I uh, see, uh, Sudish Pai, uh, reference to cases, reference to uh, Cardozo, Frankfurter, and uh, his other uh, uh, personalities. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, uh, lecture has uh, actually uh, immensely uh, enriched us uh, because of, uh, new uh, ideas and new thoughts have been uh, given uh, for a uh, uh, critically examining this uh, basic structure uh, doctrine. Uh, of course, uh, still after 50 years, uh, almost 50 years, uh, we are not uh, 
uh, in a very stable position in so far as a B6 structure is concerned. That is uh, the thing that, that we to take. With this, uh, let me uh, conclude. Uh, let me heartily uh, thank uh, Sri Sudhish Bhai for uh, rendering a, a very scholarly presentation on uh, this particular thing. Sri Sudhish Bhai, whether uh, 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 speaking any anything or uh, uh, whether uh, you'll be responding or uh, uh, presidential uh, remarks will be not. Professor, the whole, the whole, the whole idea was more to provoke the thought. As I yes, said, sir. I come with more questions than answers. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank yes, you sir. so much. I, I really agree that uh, uh, there are very really serious uh, difficulties in so far as uh, application of business structure uh, is concerned. That uh, uh, idea of uh, confining the whole basic structure scrutiny to that a uh, golden triangle is a uh, really inappropriate it is a uh, totally illogical because uh, a basic structure theory was a uh, developed outside part three of the constitution yes especially on the basis of a uh, directive principles and especially by using a structural interpretation if we go through catch on the case structural interpretation is the basis and also uh, value approach, uh, both are there, but structural in, uh, interpretation is uh, more convincing. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, and confining it to this uh, golden triangle of Article 14, 19, and 21 uh, may not be uh, uh, appropriate at all because uh, in the Constitution that is not the only triangle. You may have several triangles if you read. Uh, Lawrence tries a book on an invisible constitution. Uh, he gives uh, so many geographical, uh, I mean, uh, uh, geometrical, so many geometrical uh, expressions, uh, so many triangles, uh, circles, uh, then uh, squares, or uh, uh, so many other uh, types of uh, forms. Uh, thus, uh, uh, confining it to world triangle is uh, totally illogical. Uh, we have to go for some uh, better uh, norm, better better standard which uh, you can uh, you can achieve. Uh, of course, uh, your uh, presentation has uh, provoked uh, uh, thinking, yeah, and uh, some of the uh, difficulties are uh, really pointed out. And uh, we cannot uh, take basic uh, structure blindly because uh, uh, there are uh, real difficulties uh, in in uh, identification of a basic structure or. Uh, uh, say nullifying uh, any of uh, the provision as a bis as a value of a bis structure or uh, uh, applying it to ordinary legal norm, let alone uh, executive action. Executive action that it is a rudderless. There is a no standard at all because uh, anything uh, can be uh, brought under uh, that heading and uh, it may not be uh, appropriate at all. As uh, in a SR Bombay case. Without resorting to base structure theory, also the court could have arrived at that conclusion. It was a more uh, in the form of arbitrary dicta. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, may I now request Dr. Bhima Bhai Mulge, Assistant Professor of KS News Law School, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Rashmi. Are there any questions to be taken? Are there any questions to be taken? Uh, yes, no, yes, sir. If there are, if there are, some, if there is time, I, mean, I don't because we are already nearing twelve. Uh -uh. If there are some questions, some questions may be taken up. So uh, there are no questions as posted in the chat. Rashmi, box. I think uh, some persons are raising their hands. Uh, uh -huh. They can come up with their questions. Malik Arjun, sir, one, one or two questions we can take. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, all. And uh, it was very interesting to... Namaste, sir. Namaste, namaste. It was very interesting to hear uh, both views on the very interesting topics from two scholarly persons. As a result, uh, I really undergo a very pleasant intellectual disturbance, rather. 
so in light of that my question is uh, i consider it a conundrum rather as you stated sir we always uh, find a difficulty in uh, balancing between uh, judicial activism and judicial restraint on the one hand uh, there are uh, scholars who suggested law is nothing but last interpretation given by the last judge of the apex court and uh, there are uh, counter arguments as well in this uh, we if we consider basic structure theory as the result of absolutist attitude of the judges similarly in us context the substantive uh, <clears throat> due process was at times criticized as it's an oxymoron substantive and due process cannot go together however these two are the results of perfect judicial activism when we accept judicial activism it results into absolutism undemocratic process as such they are not desirable at the same time as our honorable professor uh, ishwar bhat sir suggested it stood the test of time for 49 years and as a result there is societal sanction for it when we face this kind of situation of course you said very uh, validly probably that is a kvt would have taken sir with the last statement that is a basic dilemma dilemmas of art and law in the end are not dissimilar i was really uh, i did take some clue from that uh, quote yet my straight question now sorry for being elaborating when one faces when one faces an inevitable hazard of tilting the balance towards either restraint or activism when it is inevitable i have to tilt it either towards the restraint or towards the activism what is the call you would take sir i do i with great respect professor i don't think anyone can give a straight answer yes or no i mean that's my humble understanding it would all depend on the circumstances and the context and to what extent one would go i don't think it would be fair to say only this much or never it would all depend and for that we have to perhaps if i may stray into a different field say it is there that the personnel who exercise judicial review become important mm -hmm. the kind of wisdom and scholarship that they need to have otherwise well in fact i think it was sirvai who said you know this beautiful expression felt necessities of the time is all right in the hands of great judges with lesser souls it can play havoc i think that is a general truism with respect i would very humbly reiterate it it all depends on who is exercising the power and that is why we come back to that we must have the proper personnel in the superior judiciary i mean no disrespect or anything to anyone but i am talking as a matter of principle thank you sir thank you so much thank if there are no questions so uh, we may proceed to the vote of thanks first there's one question sir Dr. Manoj, raise the hand there, ma. You may. Manoj, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Manoj, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now it is unmuted. Yes, yes. Good afternoon, uh, professors. Uh, the my question is regarding this right to property. So when uh, Minerva Mill case came up before the Supreme Court. Uh, though the issue was related to right to property because mill was nationalized but that 44th amendment that deleted a right to property was not challenged in the case rather the previous amendments to the constitution were challenged that is to article 368 so uh, by that reason 44th amendment remained unchallenged so right to property that has been deleted by 44th amendment does it mean right to property is not a basic structure of the constitution 
that's one part of the question second part of the question is sir uh, maybe in the year 2009 a pil was filed in the supreme court to declare 44th amendment as unconstitutional but the petition was dismissed so by this uh, uh, decisions of the supreme court in minerva mill plus this dismissal of a pil in 2010 does it mean uh, impliedly court is admitting that doctrine of eminent domain is a basic structure of the constitution but not right to property yes sir. that that was my question you kindly repeat the question sir the 44th amendment that deleted right to property yes. has remained unchallenged though it was challenged in 2009 by a way of pil to declare it as unconstitutional court rejected that pil dismissed that pil so does it mean court is impliedly telling right to property is not a basic structure of the constitution definitely right to property is not a basic structure right to property is not even a fundamental right it is of course a legal right and a constitutional right and thank god it is not part of the basic structure otherwise the whole intentment of removing it from the fundamental rights chapter would be lost the rejection of a pil cannot uh, give rise to such a, a such an assumption yes right to property is a basic structure etc right to property is adequately protected through the doctrine of reasonableness yes. under uh, article 300a it's a constitutional right. also be in conformity with article 14 and 21 to that extent uh, it's a protected right that rescue there is no problem and uh, to give a status of a beach structure is a something a reversing a the whole of a constitutional development yeah. it's a totally improper yeah that would reverse the whole constitutional history right from the first amendment thank you sir okay okay if if no questions then uh, we may proceed further sir thank you sir uh, i now request dr bima bai mulge assistant professor of ksl us law school to kindly deliver the vote of thanks please ma'am thank you rashmi good morning everyone honorable dignitaries distinguished invitees and dear participants i deem it a privilege to propose vote of thanks on behalf of karnataka state law university hubali first of all i would like to express my sincere thanks to sri v Sudeesh Pai, distinguished lawyer, jurist, and acclaimed author, Bangalore, for gracing this occasion and delivering an interesting and thought-provoking speech on the basic structure doctrine in Indian constitutional law, genesis, nonsense, <laughs> and perils. Sir, I am confident that participant got immensely benefited by listening to your scholarly lectures. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I express my sincere thanks. to professor dr p ishwar bhat honorable vice chancellor karnataka state law university hubali sir is a source of inspiration for all of us i thank sir for his support and encouragement in organizing this lecture thank you sir thank you i humbly thank sri mohammad jubair registrar kslu for his guidance and support thank you sir i convey my sincere thanks to our beloved dean and director kslu kslu hubali and kslu's law school professor dr ratna r bharam gowda for being a source of inspiration and extending unconditional support in organizing this special lecture thank you ma i thank professor dr g b patil registrar evaluation kslu hubali and professor dr c s patil former dean and director kslu hubali for their extended support thank you sir i thank all the guests invitees syndicate and academic council members principals and faculty members of all the affiliated colleges faculty coordinators faculty members of kslu and students for being a part of this lecture and making this event a grand success thank you one and all thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am uh, now we here we may adjourn for the day i once again thank all of you for being